I was born in 1962 at a place called Xerém. Xerém is located in the neighborhoods of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And probably the word Xerém doesn't mean anything for most of you. But you might have seen or even tasted the pleasure of some of Xerém products, very well known and part of my country's most rich cultural experience and export products, music and football. Xerém is associated to major football players. If you like and you've seen the national team playing, we have at this moment Thiago Silva and Marcelo, two of the greatest players at this that we know of, they come from Xerém. If you like music, especially, specifically samba, you would recognize the words of Zeca Pagodinho, uh, also a Xerém native, who sings and makes songs to make so many people happy in Brazil. Samba, that touches our heart. But anyway, Xerém was not that famous, or still is not, and the major product when I was born there was not music or football. It was cars, cars and trucks built in Brazil for Brazilian people. That was part of an old time dream of Brazil to become a big nation, industrial nation, and producing Brazilian cars was reality. And it went on for a certain number of years, but when I was about to turn two, three weeks before my second birthday, a major event happened to my country that changed the life of my family and to many other families. Brazil went into a dark period of military intervention. Democracy was forgotten, militaries took over. To my family, to my dad, that meant that in a matter of weeks to months, we had to leave Xerém. We were out of job, we had no place to live, and we had to find a new place to start over. Finally, my dad found a place to work, found a job in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it's natural that at five years old, you start to have your memories that you can really recall. And it's not by chance that my first memories, I mean the oldest memories from my childhood, come in black and white. Not only because I'm colorblind, I still see a lot of things in black and white, like this picture, but because we had this major modern machine called the black and white TV. They would be sitting in the middle of the living room of the typical middle class, to lower class family. And through the black and white TV, I could see amazing things that I can still remember, very strong. Black and white TV was to my generation what radio was to my parents' generation and what internet and cell phones are to your generation. So let me describe a few things I've seen through the black and white TV. I saw, I remember my dad showing me two funny dressed men walking slowly, like jumping and playing in the dirt. And although I could not see their faces, I could tell they were having fun. And my dad would tell me, look, son, they're walking on the moon. I thought that was very bizarre, but if my dad said we could walk on the moon, I said, well, maybe one day I can walk on the moon too. And he said, yes, you could, but first eat your Spanish. Finish your plane. <laughs> I said, good dad. I can also describe you with details the crowning of a king, a Brazilian king. His white shirt shining against this dark skin. He was carrying a white ball in his hands like a trophy. He was being carried by the crowd. Everybody shouting his name. But somehow the king was sad. He was crying and I could not understand. He should be so happy. He had just scored his 1,000th goal of his career against my dad's team that naturally became my team, Vasco da Gama. And, but some, for some reason the king was crying and he was crying people out. Please help the young kids, the poor kids in Brazil. Please take care of the poor kids in Brazil. And I thought, well, this king must have been a poor kid when he was a kid. Very sad story appeared. And only years later, I could understand the importance of Pelé, King Pelé, to Brazil and to the world of football. 
But my, the most striking image I carry from that time was it, that came from Africa. I didn't know where Africa was, but long, of course, a far away place. And over there, I heard the story that a man went into a man's chest, took out his heart, and put inside another man's heart, saving his life. At that time, I could not even think what happened to the first man, but I was so surprised with that. I was so shocked that I told my mom, Mom, this is what I want to do in my life. I want to be a transplant doctor. I'm going to be a transplant doctor. And that's exactly what I am now, 50 years, two months and three weeks later, after this December 3rd, 1967, I am a transplant doctor. I'm not a surgeon, I'm a transplant physician. If uh, another day I'll explain what I do, but basically it's the same magic, the magic of organ transplantation. It's really interesting. I, now I teach in medical school and I ask my students, why have you chosen to be a medical doctor? Do you remember the day you made that decision, such an important decision? And even, why do people decide such important things so early in life? It's not necessary. So most students have a traditional answer. Well, I don't know, my dad, my mom, they were you know, medical doctors. That influences our decisions, of course. But then, every once in a while, I get an answer. Oh, this is a no-time dream, just like myself. A no-time dream. So let's talk a little bit about dreams. Uh, when I look back to the 60s, uh, a few years ago, I went to this exhibition in London called Everything Was Moving. There was about uh, black and white photographs from the 60s. And I think that title fits perfectly, the 60s. When I think back of the 60s, people were dreaming and dreaming high. They were dreaming about such important things, still very important today, like peace, love, birth control, social rights, racism. They were fighting, not only dreaming, they were dreaming and fighting. And I'll tell you, that was a generation of achievers. For the first time, the men could run 100 meters faster than 10 seconds. One jump from as high as the stratosphere and landed safely on the parachute, a record that was only broken more than 50 years later. And as I said before, men went as far and back as to the moon and came back safely. So it really seemed like everything was possible in the 60s. And at that time, I, I believe that when I thought about being a transplant doctor, I was just joining a group of people, a growing group of people that believes in eternal life. So these images come from the British Museum, and we know that the Egyptians in the old time, they always thought about having a key to eternal life, longevity. So basically, what I, the message I want to tell you is, I want to live forever, and I really believe I'm going to live forever. And I'll try to tell you in the next minutes how I'm going to manage. But before I'll tell you my recipe, let's call it like that, or my strategy, uh, let, let's go from ancient Egypt to ancient Greece and see a few words of those men who spent a lot of their time thinking. No man can ever step in the same river twice. So the explanation is kind of obvious. As the water flows, the river is always different, and as time goes by, the man or woman is always changing. So it's a very interesting thing. And with that in mind, I'm going to bring you to my river, which is, as I mentioned before, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This is my river. Uh, well, the story, I don't know if it's, that's very precise, but some people say that the name of Rio de Janeiro comes from the idea that when the Portuguese arrived there, apparently the French were there before, but let's see, let's say the Portuguese were there. They saw this place, which now we know it's a bay, that they thought it was a delta of a river. So the name river comes, Rio comes from river. It's just direct translation. So as my, the river from the Greek people, uh, every time I come back to Rio, I see a different city. It's changing all the time, and it's always beautiful. I think it's changing, but it keeps beautiful. This year, Rio is going to celebrate 450 years. Old city, at least for Brazilian terms, 
Yeah, so let's try this experience. experience. You think of something very old. Let's doesn't have to be a person. It could be like your city or your street, the street where you grew up at. Close your eyes. Think of your street. If you think about it, I don't know how old your street is, but the neighbors you used to know when you were young, they most likely, some of them are not there anymore. They don't live there anymore. They even passed away, they moved for different reasons, and new neighbors came in. So this is very interesting because it's still the same street or the same city, but people are changing and the street is still alive. The street will only be dead the day when new people don't come anymore or the people, the few less, less people who are there are gone. So it's like changing, coming and going is part of the, of the game to keep something so alive for such a long time. So let's back to Rio and, and show you another idea. Uh, Rio comes from, Janeiro comes from January, so that's the month where my city was uh, founded. But not many people know that January is also relates to a Roman god called Janus. It's a double-faced god represented by different artists like this sculpture that looks simultaneously to the past into the future. So in a genus like strategy, and uh, I'm going to exercise my and present you my strategy to live forever in, in two parts. First part, and this is to honor one of my favorite American musicians, Tom Waits, relates to the past, or more than the past, to the inner part. I mean, to look into the interior like Janus with one of the faces look to the inside. Uh, and I'll tell you another story. When I turned 50, uh, my family, my wife and two daughters, took me to Havana, Cuba. And among the beauties of uh, Cuba, you know, first, number one is people from Cuba, we saw these old cars, most of them made in the 50s, still running. And I was very impressed to, to see how old cars will, would still be running. And I would ask one of the cab drivers, how do you manage to do it? And he said, oh, it's very simple. First, we need those cars. Second, we take care of them and try not to break them. And third, if it breaks, we fix it. So my strategy of keeping my life in a, for a long time has to do with conserving my health. And we only awarded with one car in life. Some have better models, better looking cars, some have faster cars than others, but it's only one car. So keep good care of your car. And for that, medicine has many things. And research has been showing us that we are understanding on a cellular level the process of aging and rebirth. A <laughs> uh, long time ago, a scientist called Kerr in 72 described a very important scientific phenomenon that changed the way we see life and death, at least in the cellular level. He described a term called apoptosis. That means every cell has in the genetic code the capacity of dying, and every cell has to die after a certain time. So just like our neighbors, we have to die and live again to keep living. And as we are speaking now, many of our cells are dying and new ones are being replaced. And if you're, after a certain age, most likely, all of your cells that were there when you were born, they were not there anymore. They died while you were alive. And you continue to die while you're still living. It's a crazy thing, but this is part of the process of living and dying. And we have to respect that. So dying is part of the game. Then we move to the second part that it refers to a Brazilian song from Zeca Pagodinho that I mentioned first from Xerém that's called Let Life Carry Me or Deixa a Vida Me Levar. And this is better presented in a to-do list. And I'll tell you in the very few minutes uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Because now I'm looking to the outside of my gender's view. Would you think it's, it would be interesting to have eternal life by ourselves? No, we need other people. So the way I see the strategy to live forever goes and depends on other people. 
and of course people that are close to you, and sometimes people that you don't even know. So my to-do list has to do, please, I need the help of every, everybody to, to reach my eternal life. Number one, right after my heart stops, and one day the old 55 is gonna break, uh, I'd like to join another body and leave parts of myself. So I'll be an organ donor, that's a very obvious thing. So please host me whenever I need it. I want to place my liver, my kidney, whatever is already in use, in other people's part. And that will extend my life for a few years. But then I could reach more people, and I'll donate my tissues. And I'll bring you know, my bones, my skin, my eyes, even my blood that I can donate while I'm alive. I want to reach other people through my cells and tissues. And of course, they can go on. As we go smaller, I can donate my genes. And that's part of the, the list that I've already, thanks to my lovely wife, already checked. I have two beautiful daughters that will take me, to, hopefully, to the next century. But I think the most impact I can cause on people would be by exchanging ideas. So for the rest of my life from now on, I'm going to be writing books. I'm going to be spending a lot of time with friends see old friends, try to make new friends, exchange ideas, and hopefully, through the ideas, I will touch their emotions. And just like my dad that passed away last year, who is still in my heart, is going to be living with me forever, that's the emotions that we bring to people that keep us alive forever. Confesso que sou de origem pobre Mas meu coração é nobre, foi assim que Deus me fez. Deixa a vida me levar, vida leva eu. Deixa a vida me levar, vida leva eu. Deixa a vida me levar, vida leva eu. Sou feliz e agradeço por tudo que Deus me deu. I'm going to live forever.